So thank you everyone for uh, for being here to the to the panelists and to the to the participants. Uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, the participation of everyone. But I would like to start with also a few thanks for, for the support we have received. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our college, so West Virginia University, Eberly College of Arts and Science, uh, the administration in general, but also some specific people, in particular Dean Gregory Dunaway and Associate Dean Duncan Lorimer, and few other people who supported this as other events. The Eberly uh, College Interdisciplinary Research Collaborative on Global Challenge and Local Response Initiative was inaugurated last January. And uh, with the support of both the Dean and the Associate Dean I just mentioned. And uh, through this time, we have already organized uh, a few events. Uh, in March, in collaboration with the other collaborative on climate, we have uh, organized the uh, event panel on US, US rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. And later on, in April, we have organized uh, 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 showcases on uh, global challenges and local response initiative with various colleagues from, from the Everly College. This is a uh, third event, which I'm very grateful to collaborate with uh, 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 Professor Bradley Wilson of the West Virginia University Center for Resilient Communities. Uh, it's the first uh, uh, joint event we can say we are organizing, uh, and I'm very pleased we are organizing on these topics uh, and on this day of the uh, Human Rights Day. Uh, let me tell you, uh, Professor Wilson will tell you more, but let me tell you what I see here. It's an opportunity for various uh, groups and research uh, centers and activity of our college to work together from different perspectives and to work with other colleagues around the world, among those also the speakers that are going to, to, to be part of, uh, of the panel today. So it's, it's a great opportunity to match different expertise. The, uh, the Eberly College uh, Interdisciplinary Research Collaborative on Global Ch Challenges and Local Response Initiative wanted to put indeed together two aspects, the, the global issues and the global challenge that we are facing around the world that include various aspects, includes climate issues, include uh, human rights include, of course, some of the topics that are covered, even uh, uh, like genocide or terrorism or uh, the challenges given by uh, trade wars or uh, any of topics that requires multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, expertise. One person cannot solve these issues. We need the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams with different disciplines represented and possibly even different countries represented in this type of uh, 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 conversation, research, and uh, possible uh, land grant and on the ground uh, uh, experience as well. And that's where uh, our collaborative on global challenges, the local response, find a really a great match with uh, our Center for Resilient Communities represented by Professor Wilson. And Professor Wilson will say a few, few more things about it from his side. Uh, the most recent event from the Center of Resilient Communities I would like to endorse today, considering also the perspective of the topics we are analyzing from the Human Rights Day is the Sustainable Development uh, Goals Day that was organized by the West, uh, West Virginia University Center for Resilient Communities. That was a great event, a great opportunity. And today it's a, a, an additional opportunity to let uh, uh, the conversation going uh, on understanding how sustainable development goals and human rights uh, uh, are interacting, are intersecting, and unfortunately sometimes are even conflicting one with, with the others. And I hope that the speakers will, with this additional conversation, will help us to see their perspective that comes from academia, there are in this panel, including us, academics, and there are 
uh, uh, practitioners and activists and no profit organization and uh, think tanks are represented here. So I feel that we had a combination of speakers and in terms of diversity of the background, diversity of their experience, diversity of their own history and personal uh, perspective that will nourish uh, by itself a conversation on such important day like uh, the Human Rights Day. And let me tell you a few words about it because it is, is indeed the center, the center of the topic. The Human Rights Day, it's observed every day on December 10. And is the day the United Nations General Assembly adopted in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Of course, uh, as uh, many of us know, this is a milestone document that has uh, uh, granted uh, opportunities to uh, proclaim the inalienable, inalienable rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, language, political, or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. And so this is really uh, extremely important for us to remind that all these different diversity are not conflict one in, with each other, but are actually helping uh, each one of us to understand that all these diversity are like the colors of the rainbow. The rainbow cannot be represented by itself without each one of these different colors or different uh, elements I've just listed. And if you remove one or you remove part of one, you don't have the full colors of the rainbow. And so, and that is also clearly demonstrated by the colors of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. So every of the 17 sustainable development goals represents at the same time, a way to interpret that uh, specific goal but also a way how to uh, uh, um, in, uh, represent that goal in the middle of all the other goals. And that's one of the major uh, difference that we have between the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. The fact that Sustainable Development Goals require the fact of looking to the next, to the various nexus that all these goals have constructively and positively trying to interpret those issues in the, best, in, the best, in the best possible way. And doing these reasonings and on the day of the Human Rights Day, I think it's really, it's really a great opportunity. Before, before introducing the specific speakers and the, and the panelists and the topics, this was just the introduction to the events or so the welcoming remarks. I now want to give the floor to my dear colleague, uh, Professor Bradley Wilson from the Department of Geology and Geography, but also the director of the Center for the Res uh, Resilient Communities. And thank you, uh, Bradley, for working together for this event. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Farah, and, and welcome to our panelists. And on behalf of, of all uh, who are joining us today, uh, online. We thank you so much for taking this time out of uh, what I'm, I'm certain are an incredibly busy schedule uh, to contribute to this conversation. And I think, uh, as Dr. Farah has said, this is a, a both part of an ongoing conversation, but hopefully is generative of new conversations. Um, and for everyone who's joining us, myself included, an opportunity to um, expand our understanding of, of the human rights um, movement, um, recognizing the, the grand challenges that we have uh, before us, um, but that each of us and each and, and every one of our communities are, are working towards, um, you know, uh, trying to create a, a world which is more just uh, uh, and, and where all have uh, the opportunity to live in dignity um, and to make their full contributions to society. And so our panelists today is very exciting. We'll be sharing um, their perspectives um, and hopefully we'll have uh, time 
if not today, over um, many future conversations to hear from all who are participating, our attendees. Um, and, and I hope that our panelists will continue forward with us as well. Um, at uh, the Eberly College of Arts and Sciences um, at West Virginia University, uh, we have a faculty of more than 100 uh, folks who are many working towards uh, and advancing human rights in their various fields. Um, our graduate students and undergraduate students are committed to advancing human rights. So I was really pleased uh, when Dr. Farah presented the concept of hosting this panel um, on Human Rights Day uh, to participate and uh, as, a, as an individual and to encourage our colleagues as well. Um, and we'll, we'll look forward to learning uh, more about this uh, going forward. We are living through a really um, unprecedented time. Um, and uh, it's good to take these moments out of our busy lives uh, to communicate with one another. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists. And I thank everyone um, very much and, and Dr. Farrar in, in particular um, for, for putting this together. Um, and looking forward to, yeah, looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Bradley. Thank you very much. And uh, let me now go, go to start the, the work. So introducing, uh, introducing the speakers. Uh, so we have today with us uh, uh, Dr. Chamo Kukuzfami, uh, and I'm certainly sure I, my pronunciation was not uh, standard, but I will ask her to repeat her name one more time. Uh, from Hertfordshire Law School in United Kingdom, a fellow colleague also from uh, uh, the European Society of International Law, where we have met and we are collaborating together for various activities. And then uh, uh, the next speakers, uh, 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 Beth Roberts from Landesas Center for Women's Lands Rights in Seattle, in the state of Washington, in the United States, that will present on sustainable development goals, human rights, and climate, land, and gender perspective. And then we will have another speaker, Elena Longer from the Fair Trade Advocacy Office, FTAO from Brussels, Belgium. And she will present on business and human rights, the future euros about human rights and environment due diligence process. Uh, we, we, we will see if we have our first speaker, uh, Renu Mishra from uh, Association for Advocacy and Legal Initiative in India will also join us. And she will present on women's rights or human rights. And we will see due to the time, time zone and schedule, probably she might have had problems or to connect. We will see if she will connect on during the, the meeting. We will, we will have a hand probably as a last speaker after, after the other colleagues will, will complete their, their comments. I would grant every speaker at least uh, 12 minutes uh, that you would say you would never be able to cover probably everything you would like to share with us in 12 minutes. You, we, we start with 12 minutes and then there will be questions from the attendees and questions from us. Uh, so there will be an opportunity. So uh, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Dr. Chamo Kukumasri, and please, uh, you, you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, it's lovely to see everyone here from across the pond, uh, if you like. I'm going to share my uh, screen because I have a few slides that I'd like to use during my talk. So I want to focus on uh, children and uh, genocide uh, today. I want to talk about a particular uh, a case, and in order to give some background to that case, I want to talk to a group of people known as the Yazidis. You may have heard of them. The Yazidis have been subject to genocide. Instead of presenting pictures of suffering and of great the events that took place, I chose today to actually celebrate the Yazidis for the group that they are, for the people that they are. So the pictures here 
encapsulate the identity of the group and the reason that the group has been persecuted. The picture of the peacock, a very, very pretty picture. However, unfortunately, there's a deep, long history of violence associated with this group who are personified by this image. When I first came across Yazidis, I was struck, in fact, by angel, which is at the heart of their beliefs. Because where I grew up, the peacock was all of belief in South India. So the Yazidis are, you would have gathered by now, a religious minority. To give you some background, they, they are a group as described by Nalida Fukaro in, her, in their book. I has remained in the periphery of periphery of the societies among which they have lived both socially and geographically and throughout history. They are known as the other Kurds, subject to persecution by the Kurds as well as by other groups of people around them. They are located mainly in the regions of Northern Iraq. They espouse ancient beliefs which are pre-Zoroastrian, Iranian. Here's a picture, a picture of tranquility. It's actually a temple in Armenia of the Yazidis. Here's another picture closer to home for me, which is a picture from Germany, from mainland Europe. This is a grave of a Yazidi man in Hanover. There again, you see the sculpture of the peacock dominating this grave. There are actually over 200,000 Yazidis in Germany. And Germany is the home to the largest number of Yazidis outside Iraq. You may have heard of the Yazidi woman who was one of the two winners of the Nobel Prize for Peace. And what I present in this slide here is the, it's an extract from the pages of the Nobel Prize Committee's website, which talk about her life and her work. A very young life, but a life that has seen tremendous suffering. It's not a story that we have not heard before, but what's painful is that it is being repeated time and again. The Yazidis have not only been subject to genocide most recently, since 2014 by the Islamic State that launched brutal attacks on homes and villages in the region in Northern Iraq. But even through history, the Ottomans have been responsible for similar massacres and genocide. So this is a voice and a person who personifies all of that. My question today is how has the, the establishment of a number of treaties, starting with the landmark, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, addressed all of this. So as I have underlined in this slide, the, the case I wanna talk about starts with the events that took place in 2014. The basic picture is there. The Islamic State, a group of armed militants attacked, and also took away a number of women and young girls, children, subjected them to untold violence through a number of different activities, including holding them as sex slaves. And Nadia was one of them. The case I'm, not, I'm gonna talk about today is not that of Nadia Murad, it is that of a child.
and here you you see sorry i'm just going to try and remove the um so here you see what actually happened in 2014 it was a systematic killing violent and brutal that was organized and planned which needs to be addressed and it has been addressed the next few slides i will talk about what's been happening since then but in this particular graphic you see on the top center of the graphic is the region where the Yazidis live. The different names in red are the towns and villages. The red arrows mark the capture and movement of people, of Yazidi people from that region out to different places enabled by IS. There were registration sites where the people that were moved were documented, were recorded. Then they were transported, depending on their gender, depending on their age, depending on their ability to different sites, either to military holding sites, training centers, or to slave markets. Before I go on to discuss what happened in the particular case, the judicial intervention I want to talk about today. Where are we today with the actions against these gross violations of human rights? So in 2021, there were two significant developments outside of the judicial framework. On the 1st of March, the Parliament of Iraq passed a bill which recognizes the suffering, the untold suffering that has affected the Yazidi community. And in particular, I want to highlight this bill, which provides for compensation, measures for rehabilitation and reintegration, pensions, provision of land, housing, education, and also a quota in public sector employment for all those who have been affected. So we have to see how this is going to help with the future lives of those who have been affected. And we also have a determination, which came out on the 10th of May, 2020, 2021, this year, from UNITAD, which has determined that ISIS action in Iraq constitutes genocide. All very positive developments from an international human rights perspective, as well as international governance, perspective, but one that has to be followed up in order for justice to actually be delivered. About 10 days ago, there was a very significant success from a court of law, which for the first time recognized the Yazidi genocide. Now, before I go into the details of this case, it is significant to say that the international community has acted speedily and produced the result that we are looking for. What we need to do now is to scale it up. Task. So starting with 2014, when the genocide started, we have a decision from a court of law pointing out the gross violation of human rights in the form of a crime of genocide by 2021, faster than any other previous such trial. So to talk to you about the case of prosecutor against Taha al-Jumeli, it came up before the higher court in Frankfurt in Germany in 2020. The defendant is accused of having bought a woman belonging to the Yazidi religious minority and her five-year-old daughter as slaves at the end of May the beginning of June 2015. The woman and child were offered for, for sale as slaves together with other Yazidi women and children at an IS base in Syria. They were taken from their home, hometown in, of Kocho in northern Iraq at the beginning of August 2014 state, and subsequently bought and sold several times. The defendant is said to have brought the two Yazidis to his household in Fallujah at the end of June, the beginning of July, 
2015. During the imprisonment, he had forced them to do housework, to obey strict Islamic beliefs. In addition, both are said to have been insufficiently supplied with food and were repeatedly punished in the form of beatings. One day, between the end of July and September 2015, an incident happened which caused the death of the child. The defendant inflicted a brutal punishment on the child for bedwetting. First, he caused the mother to step barefoot outside into the courtyard. In temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius, even in the shade in Fallujah at that time, the mother suffered great pain. After she re-entered the house about half an hour, the defendant is said to have called the child to punish her as well. The defendant is said to have handcuffed the weakened child who called for their mother to a window unprotected from the sun as a result of which the child died. Now, what is very important and significant is to note that the prosecutor brought the case against the defendant on the charges of murder and human trafficking under the German Civil Court, as well as under the German Code of Crimes under international law on the charges of crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. So what happens is there have been previous cases where Yazidi genocide, or rather Yazidi killings have been questioned under criminal law of countries. So there was a case in Iraq. However, genocide was not mentioned. And now this is very significant, particularly from the perspective of human rights, because in the case of the Yazidis, the freedom to practice their religion is the one that has been curtailed for a long period in time. So not only are they subject to the restrictions of their human rights, the accumulated effects of all of that when they continue to resist that and practice their identity and their religion is led to genocide. So it's very important that courts, prosecutors, do have enough evidence and are able to address the crimes for what they are. And that is why this particular judgment is a landmark judgment, and one that has opened the doors for further such prosecutions in Germany itself, but also a call for other states to follow. My last slide is this. In the context of sustainable development goals, Goal number 16 of peace, justice, and strong institutions. It requires that by 2030, we provide access to all and build effective and accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. SDGs, SDG goals are structured as targets and indicators. So the target 16.1, particularly talks about significantly reducing all forms of violence. 16.2, ending abuse, exploitation, and trafficking of all forms against, against torture of children. There are other SDGs which are also relevant to children. They do need to be taken into account together. However, this is one particular SDG which ensures the core human rights of children which is their right to life. So a significant legal mechanism to build strong institutions of justice are definitely courts. We may take this for granted. However, how the courts function, how the courts assume jurisdiction of disputes is something that needs to be addressed. Because not every court in the world has been able to question the atrocities, although they have the jurisdiction to question. So that's why it's actually unique that the German court tried Taha al jumeili And what did the German court do that we should do more of? The German court assumed what's known as universal jurisdiction, which is a special mechanism in international law, whereby irrespective of the place of the crime, the nationality, of the defendant, any country which is not associated with it, as long as it is a international crime, which includes the crime of genocide, the courts can assume jurisdiction. UK courts can assume jurisdiction, could have assumed jurisdiction of 
Taha al Jamili. US courts could have done so. Indian courts could have done so. So on that point, I will certainly say that there are aspects in jurisdiction that become very important for the, the goal 16 of SDG. There's another question, which I will leave it open for, which is, are courts failing people? Is the law failing people? I will answer that question with a partial yes, because we need legal diversity. In this particular case, the child will get justice, but what could we have done in the legal framework, which would have resolved disputes locally, which wouldn't have led to the loss of the life? So I think in order to preserve life, we do need legal diversity. One example is to make sure that legal systems accommodate both courts, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, and more importantly, customary laws. And in the case of minority groups, this becomes a very important legal topic in the context of us achieving goal 16 of the Sustainable Development Goals. I think with that, I'll come to a stop. I hope I haven't exceeded my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. There is a lot I would like to, to ask you, but uh, indeed we need to move to the next speaker to give the opportunity to, to present. And I really thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. It, it really opened up to, to plenty of, uh, of interesting connection with this dramatic uh, reference you made, but also to the legal concern you brought uh, 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 on the floor. So there, are, there is a positive message I felt in, the, in this presentation and, uh, and this is great. Thank you again. Uh, I give you now the floor to Beth Roberts from Landesa Center for Women and Lands Rights with her presentation of SDGs, Human Rights and Climate Change, Land and Gender Perspective. Thank you very much, Beth, for your availability to be here today on this important day of Human Rights Day. Thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Faya, and thank you so much to the hosts. It's really my honor to be here today. Um, I'm very pleased to join you all on this important day in recognition of, of human rights. Um, I did get into a fight uh, with Zoom today. I had to update Zoom and then uh, my MacBook Air was very grumpy and refused to upload my PowerPoint. So uh, this topic is very close to my heart. I will just, uh, rather than trying to struggle to re-upload my PowerPoint, I will just uh, speak to you um, uh, off the cuff. Um, in technology as well as in the realms of human rights and international law and law in general, we pick our battles and so I will just pick this one today. Um, um, I, can, I can try to do that. I think, let me, let me see if I can do that very quickly. See if I, it does, the other hesitation that I have trying to do that, Paolo, is that it is mostly pictures. And so sometimes it has, it is very difficult to send through, but let okay. me, I can. Don't, don't worry, feel free to, to, to speak in the best. I was just offering okay. that I okay. could, uh, could screen share for you. So you, you feel free. Thanks okay. again. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I think I will, um, I will launch it just by telling all of you a little bit about Landessa, for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, Landessa is an international organization that works specifically on rights to land tenure and governance. We have existed for about 50 years and we've worked in over 50 countries around the world. We currently have offices in um, India and China and Myanmar in, on the Asian continent and in Liberia and Tanzania on the African continent. Uh, we have active projects in a number of other countries across the Latin American region, Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, our focus is on working specifically with governments to shift law and policy and on partnering with civil society in particular to influence government as duty bearers to strengthen land tenure and policy in a way that is focused on ending poverty. And so that is 
Um, that is our mission, that's our focus, and that's what brings me here with all of you today to, to focus on the intersection between um, the, inner, the, the SDGs and their focus on leaving no one behind and, um, and on the human rights that are at, attendant to um, the, the end of poverty and the way that those human rights attach to land. Um, and I direct our Center for Women's Land Rights. Um, for those of you who, who know about the relationship between land and poverty and gender, um, which I assume is, is most of you, if not all of you, uh, you probably know that there's no, no quicker way around the world to uh, be contentious than to talk about land tenure and governance, that it is the center of so much, um, it is the center of power and identity uh, and has been throughout human history and the center of conflict and very often the center of human rights abuses and human rights violation um, from uh, human rights defenders and the, the violence and the death that they face um, to the, the more mundane ways in which um, the approximately 2.5 billion people in rural communities and indigenous communities worldwide who depend directly on land for a living and for their identity um, uh, are, are close to the land and are caring for the ecosystems that we all depend on for survival. Uh, so that, that is an estimate for those who are either partially or totally dependent on land for a livelihood. But of course, the, the real um, way in which the human, uh, the broad global human community is dependent on land is really all of us. Um, and so, and then the other contentious way to um, start a fire in a government office or in a, in a village is to bring up the relationship between gender and land. Um, universally, uh, land is considered a male purview. Uh, it is less extreme in some contexts than others, but uh, for the most part, land is dominated and controlled by men, whether that's within the household, within the community, um, at the local level, within the governance level, at the parliamentary level, at the global level, land and natural resources are, are male dominated. And when women seek to claim their rights, uh, whether when they are uh, guaranteed within law, legal and policy frameworks, as they often are now, there has been great progress over the last few decades in working to guarantee women's legal rights to land. Women, when women try to claim those rights, there is often a deep and immediate cultural backlash to that, to that um, attempt to claim those rights. Um, there are incredibly strong social norms that relegate women to a position of not just secondary rights when it comes to land, but a secondary status that really equates to a violation of what CEDAW calls equal legal personhood. So there's a, a clause in Article 15 of the CEDAW Convention on the Convention on uh, Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women that calls for equal legal personhood. And that is not realized, or not even close to realized when it comes to the standards for equal legal rights to land and inheritance um, and property in rural areas, in peri-urban areas, in urban areas when it comes to housing and land and tenure, and certainly not when it comes to control of natural resources um, across the, the spectrum of how those decisions are made at the national level, in the climate context, when it comes to what is really determinant of the future of humanity and determinant of gender equality and the human rights of women and girls overall, women are at a distinct disadvantage and really are seen as and treated as secondary in terms of their status, are treated more often as part of the transaction as property in terms of how dowry is treated and how women are seen as moving out of a community and part of their marital home rather than part of uh, really grounded in their own, um, the home they were born in um, and given access to and, and identification with their family home and the land and property rights that um, exist alongside um, their identity with that family. Um, so women are really seen as secondary and often seen and treated sometimes in more subtle ways, sometimes more explicitly as property themselves. Um, and that is aligned with their family status, but also really very closely tied to how their identity relative to land um, shakes out. So how does this um, tie to human rights? So land itself is increasingly being recognized as a standalone human right. And that is um, in 
recognition that land is very closely tied to explicitly recognized rights to the right to food, the right to housing, the right to an adequate standard of living. So that bundle of rights that's in Article 11 of the Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, um, as well as rights enshrined in a number of other international legal frameworks. So ILO 69, the UN, uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and then more recent legal frameworks like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, which explicitly recognizes rights for tenure for indigenous folks, but also for uh, women and youth um, and recognizes rights to tenure by age. Um, there's also the voluntary guidelines on the governance of tenure, which was widely adopted by, um, um, by most governments and is widely seen as a, a grand consensus on how governments can meet their, their obligations to meet the tenure rights of, um, again, an incredibly wide swath of humanity that depends directly on land for the fulfillment of these very basic rights. Um, uh, from a human rights perspective. And how does that relate to rights uh, or to the SDGs? So there was a, uh, a group of activists and organizations and um, intergovernmental uh, bodies that was engaged in getting land into the SDGs. Landessa was engaged in a specific group called the, the Land and Momentum uh, Group uh, for the SDGs. Um, and there are three indicators under the SDGs that specifically mention land tenure. So the first is 1.4.2 uh, under goal one to end poverty. And that one um, looks for or asks uh, states parties to um, gather data on both the perception and the documentation of secure land tenure disaggregated by gender uh, for all tenure types. So across urban tenure and rural tenure. So really um, an opportunity for uh, countries to understand whether people feel secure and, and their perceptions of tenure are very important because uh, when people believe that their land tenure is secure, then they do things that um, have really great impact for climate mitigation and adaptation, for economic empowerment for their families, for investment in the land in ways that um, lead to all kinds of development and human rights and climate action benefits. Um, I think all of us, when we feel secure, do things like uh, put up plants and shelves. Uh, and when we don't feel secure, uh, we don't do those things. So whether so people's perceptions of their tenure are very important and documentation of tenure is very important and often lacking for, again, for those 2.5 billion um, people worldwide. Um, so working toward securing and documenting tenure is a huge project around the globe. Uh, then there are two uh, indicators on tenure under goal five for gender equality. Those are 5.8.1 and 5.8.2. So looking specifically on at how progress has been made for uh, the proportion of women amongst agricultural holders of land, that's 5.8.1. And then 5.8.2 looks at the guarantees for equality under both formal and customary frameworks, uh, legal frameworks. So looking at um, whether women have joint titling guaranteed, whether women have equal rights to inheritance, whether governments are, are putting forward economic incentives for women to have equal rights to land. So any number of, um, of ways in which there are moves from a government's standpoint to meet its obligations to the, that standard for equal legal personhood under CEDAW, but really working toward guaranteeing women's equal rights to land housing, uh, to land in terms of those human rights to food, housing, and an adequate standing, standard of living. Um, so those are the three specific indicators under the SDGs. There are also um, the, the way in which we think about land tenure and governance within the SDGs uh, from a climate perspective and an overall human rights perspective and to end poverty to really achieve the overall goal of the SDGs to leave no one behind is that land is, is an ecosystem within the SDGs and land tenure and governance specifically. So it is very difficult to achieve many of the overall goals of the SDGs without secure land tenure and governance. So for instance, uh, land tenure and land governance is, is mentioned in goal 15, life on land but it is not uh, in enshrined within the indicators. Uh, for goal 13 on climate, land is not mentioned within, within the goal. 
but for climate action, land tenure and governance, governance of natural resources is of course critical to um, understanding how we achieve climate action. So without, without natural resource management, without sustainable land management, without engaging those 2.5 billion um, rural land users, we will not be able to do what we have come to understand is necessary for climate action and protection of ecosystems. Uh, restoring degraded soil, protecting forests, engaging in agroforestry and sustainable farming techniques, um, protecting the rights of smallholders and indigenous people is increasingly recognized as a key, um, a key uh, approach for climate action. And land tenure is a foundation for that approach to climate action. Uh, then there are things like sustainable, sustainable work, sustainable energy, when we think about things like rural electrification, understanding who owns that land and who benefits from the land where we're setting up solar farms or even setting up power poles uh, is crucial. And so land governance is, is often um, one thing among many and, and often making the case to governments that they need to pay attention to and solve the, the very thorny problem of land governance is like asking them to build a foundation while their house is on fire, especially in the, in the face of the climate emergency. Uh, so I wanna close with uh, just one example of a mechanism, a ready mechanism for governments um, that they can use to bring together these massive global agendas that share um, national, local to national to global level reporting structures and require coherence across the national uh, level yeah, in ways that break down the silos that so often pre prevent national governments with very scarce resources from implementing these, um, these global agendas, so specifically the SDGs, human rights, um, and climate agendas in a way that is um, integrated and in a way that benefits um, those who are most at risk of being left behind. And again, um, those who are most likely to suffer poverty are those um, 2.5 billion people living in rural areas, and in particular, women and indigenous and um, youth within those communities. And, and that mechanism is national human rights institutes. Um, so national human rights institutions are present in over um, 120 countries worldwide. Um, they have a mandate on human rights implementation. They're independent from governments. Um, and they have a mandate on the SDGs as of the 2015 Merida Declaration that was agreed on by um, the Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institutions in uh, Mexico, in Merida, Mexico. And that outlines specific roles on national human rights as education, on participatory data gathering, and on um, policy coherence and support to government entities by national human rights institutions. Um, so support for implementing the SDGs at the national level in a way that recognizes that the SDGs are grounded in human rights principles and that national human rights institutions play a role for implementing and monitoring uh, human rights at the national level and supporting reporting for governments on all of these um, on all of these frameworks. And of course, climate frameworks tie very closely to poverty alleviation, to the SDGs and to human rights. Um, this year, uh, the Human Rights Council um, uh, issued a declaration on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. It is increasingly being recognized as a human right in and of itself. Um, I will close there. I know I'm over my time a little bit, but thank you so much. Again, I'm just honored to be here with you all and very grateful for, for the time. Thank you very much, Abed, for your contribution. There was actually one comment coming from the chat. I don't know. The question and answer, not the chat. I don't know if you read it, but Robert, thank you so much. My country, Bangladesh, ratified the CDAW, but with some reservation, women are suffering to do the absence land rights in, in Bangladesh. I don't know if you want to reply live uh, directly but with, with a comment or something. I, uh, I would give you, I would, I, you still have a minute, I would say. You are not in uh, taking oh. too much of your oh, time. Sure. So okay. you can well, do it. I will actually, thank you then. I'll go ahead and reply live then. Uh, we are actually engaged in work in Bangladesh and um, our key partner in Bangladesh has has been in, we've been in conversation with them about their ratification of CEDAW 
And we are working on specifically establishing rights for land uh, for women in Bangladesh. So I'd be happy to connect with you. Um, I will put my my email in the in the chat, and I'm happy to hear from from anyone who's present um, in this presentation, uh, guests and and panelists included. So thank you for the for the note. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Beth. So if we can reply live and we still have the time, that's I think is, is the best. And thanks for your availability to connect with, uh, with the participants. I also posted uh, the links. I was referring to two events we organized previously. So for, for those who are attending the, the event, I just share with you in case you want to see uh, previous events we, we have organized. And now let me introduce our uh, next speaker. Elena Lunder from the Fair Trade Advocacy Office in Brussels that she's going to present about business and human rights, the future EU rules about human rights and the environment due diligence process. And for the participant after this presentation, we will open the floor to questions for all the speakers. So if you do have already questions for the first two speakers, you can already type them in the in the question and answer uh, uh, boxes, and so uh, the speaker can already read and uh, and uh, think about responses, and and that's an opportunity for you to interact with the speaker. And again, thanks again, Elena, for being here with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm also happy to join this conversation here. Uh, usually, I I speak. Uh, and discuss in different contexts, so um, mainly EU, so this is really interesting for me. Um, I would also like to share um, a slide uh, to kind of support what I would like to present. Um, do you see the presentation in the present? Oh, no, okay, it's okay right now. Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so first, a few words about the Fair Trade Advocacy Office. Um, we are the advocacy arm of the Fair Trade Movement, uh, which is basically a Fair Trade International, uh, which you might know as the certification on, on a product such as um, chocolate, coffee, cotton, and, and other products that's, that come from global supply chains and uh, the World Fair Trade Organization, which is also a group of um, small um, social, often social enterprises uh, functioning in global supply chains. Uh, and the aim of our office is to represent the position of the movement, which includes uh, producer organizations, worker organizations in these uh, supply chains and translate the, the positions that we learn from them into advocacy work at the level of the European Union. So we function as um, an advocacy office targeting um, legislative processes um, at EU level that might have positive impacts or if not um, trying to influence them to have positive impacts uh, on human rights uh, in global supply chains. My specific focus within this office is uh, the upcoming legislation on business and human rights. So um, the, uh, in, in the European Union, it's called sustainable corporate governance. And um, I will present the development behind and, and um, during uh, this work that I am following. Um, general context is that um, at the rounds uh, in the years before 2011, Professor John Ruggie uh, received a mandate from the United Nations to look into a possible uh, framework to think about uh, possibilities of accountability for businesses in global supply chains because it has been recognized and, and then also repeatedly uh, demonstrated by the, the comprehensive research done by his team that there is um, a lot a lack of um, accountability in global supply chains uh, due to gaps between uh, human rights protection that we understand under the traditional form of international human rights law. So um, 
In 2011, uh, the, the research that was done by this group was translated into the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which were unanimously endorsed by the, uh, by the Human Rights Council in 2011 and have since really become the basis of the conversation around business and human rights. Um, the, the UNGPs, the principles um, are made of three pillars. And one, the first one is the state's existing obligation to respect, protect and fulfill human rights under, of, of um, people under their jurisdiction. The second pillar is the corporate responsibility to respect human rights um, that are uh, of, of people present either within their own operations or within the operations of their suppliers and other business um, relationships. As well as the third pillar, then um, the mandating uh, the need to access, um, to grant access to adequate remedy that is addressing both uh, the duties of state and responsibility of, of corporate entities. Um, so what's the need for, for, for this um, document and the, the, the development over the past 10 years has been so pressing because the state's existing obligation to respect, um, protect and fulfill is, is limited by their jurisdiction, which has been um, taken advantage of by, by corporations operating across um, national borders, so multinational enterprises, but also um, yeah, in, in general, but specifically at multinational enterprises that would take advantage of weaker legal systems in, in some parts of the world, in some countries, to be able to produce more cheaply or, or um, in an easier setting than, than in other uh, contexts where human rights would be enforced more strictly. And this can either be due um, to, to the fact that some um, nation states are not able, don't have the capacity to enforce um, human rights, or um, are, are for some reason not uh, willing to do so. So in, in, in addition, one of these reasons, um, it has also been uh, found quite clearly that some multinational enterprises actually hold much more power than individual states uh, in which they decide to, to place their production processes. So in that sense, it, it, would, it would not work to expect uh, these states to, to regulate the behavior of, of companies that hold so much power. Um, and since 2011, uh, the United Nations Guiding Principles, which are a voluntary instrument, have been transposed into national contexts within the European Union as national action plans on business and human rights, which was voluntary action by member states and also generally did not um, produce new obligations for companies based in these countries. Um, however, since the past more or less five years, some member states have also decided to produce legislative frameworks that would um, codify uh, this, this framework of human rights and environmental due diligence uh, under the obligation to respect uh, presented by the United Nations Guiding Principles. And in 2017, we had the first legislation in France that um, put this into their national law. So since 2017, um, about 5,000 uh, companies based in France that have more than 5,000 uh, employees are obliged to conduct human rights and environmental due diligence. I will go into the concept a little bit uh, later uh, in the global supply chains. And also uh, the legislation contains um, civil liability. So the companies can be brought to court um, either if their due diligence is not conducted properly. So if it's, it's not that the process is not rigorous enough to, to identify possible risks to human rights and the environment, or if gra grave uh, violations um, happen despite uh, the, the due diligence process in place. Since then, this summer, we have also seen a similar legislative framework uh, accepted in Germany. It's slightly uh, weaker as uh, the obligation to conduct due diligence does not span beyond immediate suppliers, 
um, but it is still a uh, really encouraging development. And similar, it's true for Norway. We also have uh, legislation in Norway already. There are political processes also going on in, in several other countries and civil society action that is really, really um, intense across almost the entire European Union. So in light of all these developments, actually at the time when only um, France had um, a national legislation, the European Commissioner for Justice has committed publicly to propose a proposal on sustainable corporate governance in this year, in 2021. Oh, sorry. So with the aim to shift uh, the focus on short term financial performance of companies to a more long term, uh, even financial performance that takes into account uh, sustainability considerations. Uh, the second aim is that the companies are um, subject to a framework that uh, requires them to properly identify and address climate change and other environmental, social and human rights uh, and risks and impacts in their operations and, and supply chains. So this was a really ambitious proposal that was actually not expected at the time by the civil society. Um, that well, proposal, commitment, we, we haven't seen the proposal yet and has been subject to a lot of attention, uh, both uh, generally from, from the public, from the civil society, um, as well as from uh, industry associations and companies and, and uh, some member states. The commission, as part of their legislative process, the, the European Commission also uh, conducts public consultations to which um, any kind of stakeholder can, um, can provide input, also citizens, and had received um, over a thousand um, replies to that uh, consultation. So it, it really became one of the most important files um, of this uh, commission that has started in 2019 and will hold uh, their term for five years. And sorry, four. And um, it's also one of the most important tools in the uh, sustainable uh, transition that the commission has vowed to do uh, during their uh, term codified in the European uh, Green Deal. Uh, the proposal is still being prepared by the European Commission though, because it's um, faced a lot of criticism by uh, industry associations, as well as some member states that have been influenced by um, corporate lobby, where, uh, yeah, the, the intensity is just so strong that uh, the, the proposal has to wait, failed twice now to be published and will hopefully be published next year with almost a year uh, of delay. So the proposal itself um, has two elements. Uh, one is corporate governance and the other one is human rights and environmental due diligence as which I mentioned before has been um, established under the UNGPs. So the European Commission, because of the goal to also move away from corporate short-termism, so the, the focus on immediate financial returns also proposed to couple the, the due diligence system with um, provisions on corporate governance, which would include um, a clarification of director's duties. So um, to, to, which would include uh, the, the, well, not redefinition, really just clarification. It would not change the existing corporate uh, legislation in member states, but the redefinition of what it means for directors to be acting um, for the good of their companies. So not to only focus on immediate um, profits, but also to long-term sustainability in all senses. So uh, environmental, social, and uh, economic. So in that sense, they, the director would bear the responsibility to integrate these elements into corporate strategy and oversee the, the uh, quality of its implementation. The second point is alignment of incentives with sustainability obje objectives. Um, and one option of doing that would be linking um, remuneration to sustainability targets. Uh, this is one of the proposals that have, has been discussed, but it, it's not very likely to, to come, go through because the, the effectiveness of this has been challenged. 
Um, finally, uh, also very important for the fair trade movement is the idea that board composition should be revised as well, so that interests of stakeholders and um, that the, the position of, of relevant experts um, are represented uh, in, in the board, uh, on the board. Uh, then the second element is human rights and environmental due diligence that consists of these uh, six steps that were established by, by the UNGPs. And it's basically, as, as you see in the visual, it, the, it would be an obligation to embed responsible business conduct into own policies of a company, to identify and assess adverse impacts. So actual and potential uh, adverse impacts in operations and supply chains, as well as business relationships. Um, and then, seize, prevent, or mitigate any adverse impacts that have been uh, identified through the impact assessment, uh, the risk assessment, then uh, track implementation and results of, of the actions uh, taken to mitigate and, uh, and prevent, and then uh, communicate about how these um, impacts have been addressed. So basically the last step is, um, a provision for transparency so that um, it is possible for both state authorities as well as uh, civil society and other uh, stakeholders uh, to oversee uh, the effectiveness of the process. Um, the sixth step is, is uh, would go under pillar three of the um, UNGPs uh, with the right to adequate uh, remedy. So a company should also be uh, obliged to provide for or co cooperate in the process of um, providing remedy. So this is can be both either um, a mechanism of, of uh, mediation, it could be judicial or uh, non-judicial remedy, depending on the situation and what, what is um, uh, the most uh, effective solution. So, what we have to keep in mind, uh, thinking about uh, this, this process that aims to improve the, the conditions uh, in global supply chains, both for human rights and the environment, is that um, in its core, the, the, the framework has been developed to improve the situation of rights holders. And in that, the specific groups of rights holders will have a specific needs when it comes to the, the um, formulation of the framework. In the fair trade movement, we have a lot of smallholder farmers. So we were able to gather their perspectives of um, how they would see this legislation impacting them and how they would see that this legislation could impact them in a positive way. So we commissioned uh, this research um, in 2019, it was published in 2020, on making human rights diligence work for smallholder farmers and workers in global supply chains, where the finding was that existing voluntary AM due diligence schemes, uh, at that time, it was basically only possible to, to oversee what has been done on a voluntary basis because obligatory frameworks uh, weren't enforced yet, um, so at least not that many. So there is a tendency that such a framework can become a tick box exercise. So instead of really looking into possible risks and finding effective solutions, just um, trying to, to fulfill the, the obligations by, by more of a nominal um, uh, nature. So on, on paper and, and not going beyond that. The second risk that the researchers identified um, was that companies might focus on human rights violations that are the easiest to address and neglect more complex issues such as uh, child labor, uh, living wages and incomes, migrant labor and, and other um, issues that are rooted in, in more systemic um, uh, frameworks uh, that, that the company would have to take their time to tackle. So for us, looking from the perspective of smallholder farmers, this is a really important issue um, because both uh, specifically living income and, and child labor uh, are, are inextricably connected to the format of, of current uh, global supply chains and would need a restructuring of, of current day-to-day -day business um, 
to be addressed. So it would not be very attractive uh, to, to pick as a salient issue uh, by companies. Then another um, risk that was identified is cut and run to less risky suppliers or countries rather than working with the suppliers that are already engaged to address the risks that are identified. So for example, looking at the context of smallholder farmers, um, looking at the, at the um, supply chain of cocoa, for example, where there is some risk of child labor the, the answer would not be to change suppliers, to go to a plantation that is more regulated and easier to oversee, but the answer would be to really have a conversation with these suppliers and understand what are the root causes of these um, of, of children working in inadequate um, circumstances and address them uh, jointly. In many cases also, companies would tend to pass the responsibility to comply with human rights to the, and, the, and the environmental standards uh, to their suppliers without changing their own practices. So this is connected to the previous point where we also already see that with, um, for example, in the European Union with organic regulation, where in order to be able to certify their products as organic, um, farmers in, in general, the co cooperatives um, have to pay significant fees to, to regular audits and checks, um, which considering that a large part um, of them, so in general, uh, this is a prevalent issue, are receiving prices for their products that are below the cost of production. So it's not really a realistic expectation um, to, to assume that going forward in, in business as usual, just placing future further responsibilities um, on smallholder farmers that are already really squeezed between um, the, the need to, to sell their products to survive and the power of their buyers to impose conditions on them that, that are extremely limiting. Um, so, yeah, this is also something that we, we try to um, voice in the, in the debates around this legislation. So specifically going into the context of smallholder farmers, it is often uh, that often, in, it is often in an informal setting where uh, there is prevalent uh, poverty, inequalities, and uh, lack of access to basic infrastructure and services, which makes it very hard to then uh, know exactly how to adapt to the new regulation and how to uh, how to improve improve uh, pra own practices, um, while also yeah not having the finances to, to to finance that transition. So low incomes that are not even enough for. Um, basic survival, so for a healthy uh, um, lifestyle, adequate food uh, housing, um, it's not enough to, to also invest in sustainable production that would then be required by other regulation as for example the deforestation regulation that was proposed recently in the European, uh, the, um, yeah, in the European Union, where uh, products that would be originating from context of deforestation uh, would not be allowed to enter the European market. So this coupled with the, the extremely low prices uh, farmers receive for cocoa uh, makes it really impossible for them to continue uh, producing. Then lack of expertise and resources to respond to increased demands for social sustainability is, is really a summary of the, of the previous points. Um, and uh, yeah, again, a visual, uh, of, of, of the power imbalances that we are trying to address here is that uh, the, the smallholder farmers are faced by a really small number of, of traders, uh, processors and brands and retailers who are able to impose um, unilaterally basically the terms under which they, they cooperate. So um, making the, the framework at EU level needs to be, well, in, in that process, um, it needs to be taken into account that um, imposing um, obligations on retailers, for example, who are facing consumers and have the most um, motivation there to, to publicly change their practices and, and talk about it and, and so on, 
um, that they will be incentivized really to just pass this uh, new obligation further down the chain, even if technically the farmers will not be covered by European legislation. Um, they might be in, impacted quite significantly, I, either in a positive or in a negative way, of course. So to, to ensure that this is actually, these are positive impacts, uh, we have developed uh, a list of recommendations together with uh, producer representatives um, in our network. So one that we share with all other civil society organizations is that the legislation must cover yeah, thank you, sorry, I'm concluding. <laughs> this is the last slide. The legislation must cover the entire um, supply chain of, of a company, otherwise these, these smallholder farmers will not be uh, benefiting from, from its provisions. Uh, purchasing practices such as pricing um, and, and uh, other terms uh, of contracts need to be included because uh, prices on the cost of production will never enable uh, actual changes in, in um, conditions of working conditions in global supply chains. This is the same for uh, labor rights uh, standards and, and other human rights uh, in, in the context of, of smallholder farmers. But then uh, another point is that the legislation must uh, have strict uh, provisions on uh, under what circumstances companies can disengage from their suppliers and when they see that any further um, engagement will not lead into an improvement of conditions. But so that but this should be made really, really hard so that uh, instead the legislation supports long-term sourcing relationships and a cooperative approach where um, companies based in Europe or placing products on, your on the European market um, support their suppliers in, through capacity building and, and better prices to also improve better um, working standards and, and other uh, environmental protection provisions. It's important to address living wages and living incomes because they are in addition to arguably being <laughs> human rights themselves, uh, preconditions for a number of other human rights uh, and cannot be left out of this. And of course, rights holders must be actively included at every step because they are the only ones that are able to say which risks are salient for them and what kind of solutions or mitigation measures or remedy uh, would address these concerns. Uh, of course, everything needs to be mainstreamed throughout the entire company and not addressed through a sustainability department. And voluntary sustainability schemes do not have a place of due diligence, but only as a tool and only if regulated strictly to, um, to, yeah, to have a, a strong uh, framework. Um, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Okay, thank you. This is... Sorry for going over my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution, Elena. Uh, I, I would like to immediately open actually to the question. We do not have uh, a lot of time. We have a few more minutes, but uh, I really want to give the opportunity if there are questions in, even among the speakers or from uh, the public. I see that there is a question for you, Elena, actually. Uh, if you can reply briefly, maybe in about 30 seconds to give up opportunity to other. Elena, do you think corporate companies are more powerful than a sovereign government? Um, in, yeah, it's, it's really not a matter of what I think. In some cases they are, and this, this is visible from, from um, several um, instances where some member state or sovereign governments are, are under pressure to adapt their uh, legislative, um, sorry, uh, a framework to attract uh, companies that will come because of the low standards um, and, and other cases really where, where um, the pressure was so strong that you can see impact of company interests on, on legislation of, of poor uh, governments. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. There, if there are further questions from uh, from the uh, attendees, uh, this is the right uh, the right moment to to submit them in the chat, so we can we can consider them. If not, I would open in any event to questions among us. Uh, maybe you, Bradley, you had uh, you you wanted to make comments or questions. Please go ahead. 
No, no, I, I don't have any comments, but I did think maybe as uh, some of the attendees are preparing their questions, I could just open a, a, an initial, which is, what would you say are some of, uh, what would you present is, I think for many on the call, perhaps very um, reasonable. These are very reasonable and important um, changes that we need to make in policy and in practice. Um, what are your in the work that you do, what do you find to be the most resistance? Uh, where, where do you find the most resistance to what you're presenting um, in the sense of, um, uh, I guess, I, I, uh, ideas, uh, existing norms, conventions, or even um, the machinery, so to speak, of, of, uh, of creating legal change at a state level, the local level. So I'm curious, uh, throughout each of your presentations, obviously you're, you're seeking to advance, um, um, again, th I think for many of the attendees on the call, things that we, we would find to be very um, important, logical, and, and critical for, for human rights and for sustainable development. So what, are, what do you see as some of the key impediments to that from with, within the communities that you're working, um, within the organizations that you're working in or um, in the leadership of, of states that you're, you're working to create change in? Oh, this, is, this is a great question for all the speaker indeed, Bradley. I would add one of mine to this because I think it can match well. Uh, what is the, the, I mean, it's a difficult question or a difficult answer. What is the biggest success you have managed to, to, to achieve in your work? In a mean, meaning, uh, what is the biggest uh, uh, change you have managed to, to obtain? Uh, and it should not be a big one. It can be even something very personal, uh, but, uh, but I think that that's really connect well with the question of Bradley. And then now I open the floor to, to the three of you, all of you. I would start from in the order of the presentation so from Chamu, then Beth, and then Elena. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bradley and Paolo. Um, a very good question. Um, work in universities, academia. Um, I think yeah, knowledge is very important at the base of resolving every issue, I think, because otherwise you risk being uh, perhaps not able to solve it perfectly. So I think universities really, well, I would say universities, that's because it's the, at the forefront of knowledge formation at the moment. The challenge I uh, see in terms of, let's say, producing the evidence base for policy that we need is this uh, working in silos, whether it's methodological ones or whether it's actually working within a discipline, because the same problem gets presented by different disciplines as different problems. And then we have diversion of resources. So I think what's really important, the resistance I find is how does, you know, how do students, first of all, study in an interdisciplinary manner? For example, how do geographers and lawyers talk together on planning law? Because you cannot enable sustainable development without that actually happening. And it's not happening at the moment. How many courses do you have like that? And I'll kind of link this with um, the question that Paula asked, what success have I found in this? Uh, a recent success, just in the context of students and interdisciplinarity and getting the interdisciplinary thinking going to produce knowledge that can resolve big issues. Um, I got students from outdoor environmental education, from uh, planning and geography, and from law to take a walk out in nature to discuss climate and sustainable development and human rights. And I think this sort of an activity is really important. It can actually be very productive for all of the groups from an academic perspective, but also from a life perspective. I think we need to crumble that down as well. So, and they go out to work in organizations, exactly like the ones that Beth and Elena are working in, then they are actually supremely acute to understand issues and they, because we need to hit the ground running now. We are in crisis mode. I think unprecedented times we are in crisis mode. Um, so I think this is what I would say is, is sort of my quest 
um, definitely, and um, in equally a challenge. Uh, but I am positive on it because I think, you know, humanity has incredible power. If you want to attain things, it can happen and it can even happen overnight. So I think that's why it's just amazing to be at an event like this today, to be talking about human rights, but all of the diversity of human rights. I mean, I absolutely enjoyed Fort Beth and Eleanor's presentation. In another time, I definitely would have engaged in women's land rights and also business and human rights. But for now, I'll stick to my humanitarian law side. Thank you so much, Beth. The floor is yours. Likewise, I'll just tag off what Chamu said. I was fascinated listening to uh, Chamu's presentation and then Elena's presentation and just thinking about how, how connected this all is. You know, the, the violations of human rights that Chamu was talking about. Um, our work is intended to protect religious and ethnic minorities and to ensure that people in poverty have a, a functioning rule of law and democracy and a voice and an escape from poverty that prevents those types of um, those types of violations ultimately. Um, it's I think the the challenges and the resistance are clarity and collaboration. Like we need a world where there is systems change in, in a vast amount of complexity across silos and we need it quickly to address things like the climate emergency, to address violations of human rights that are eminent, that are personal, that are devastating, that are life ending for people. We need that, we need those changes to happen now. Um, and we need that to happen across an, a vast number of actors in, in ways that coordinate uh, vast amounts of resources. And we need that to, to happen across different sectors. Um, you know, we have a corporate engagement initiative that works directly with companies. And so when Elena was talking, I was just thinking about, um, uh, and, and then to your question, Paolo, about successes, I think the example I'll give sort of ties this all together. You know, the, the resistance we face on gender that I named at the beginning of my talk is, is one of the key challenges that we face. Um, and we have a project in West Bengal where we're working with PepsiCo um, on, their, on their potato supply chain because they own Frito-Lay. So again, to the power of corporations and, and the massive uh, uh, influence that they have in supply chains and, and the power that they have even vis-a-vis -a, -vis a huge government like India. And we're working to engage women in their potato supply chain. And we've been able to engage in a social norms and behavior change program where we are working with men and women in communities to really shift those gender norms around women and land I was talking about. So recognizing that women don't exist in a vacuum, they exist in relationships and engaging men in recognizing the power of women's economic empowerment and women's agency and helping women recognize that as well. And we now have women running a model farm where they're demonstrating climate smart agricultural practices. They're increasing yields for PepsiCo. We have Pepsi working with the government in West Bengal. We have this chain of corporate actors, government actors, civil society, and women and men in communities shifting norms, shifting governance, shifting corporate practices toward uh, sustainability in, in farming and for the planet and for people. So I'll leave it there. Um, this has really been a pleasure. You leave it there. <laughs> you have practically, you, if, if you analyze every single sentence you have said, we speak for 10 minutes for each, but you leave it there. So thanks again, Beth. Thank you very much for, for your thoughtful, really, comments and response. I will give the floor immediately to, to Elena. Thanks again. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go really quickly, maybe, and um, start with uh, the, the achievements, maybe. Listening both to Cham and Beth, I thought what we have achieved in this movement for, for corporate responsibility at the European Union level, um, and I think we can be proud of, is this interdisciplinarity. I think we work with a lot of experts that um, have different backgrounds. So the, the input that the civil society is able to offer to the European Commission or, or in using their advocacy work has been really rich and, and really hard to argue with, even though, again, this then on the other hand is the biggest challenge. It is being argued with and without even very strong arguments. It's really more, it sounds more like, um, I think the challenge here is fear um, of, of systemic change because this is what we need. So um, the arguments that we hear 
um, or about, um, yes, we cannot do this, this is too hard, this is too expensive, this is impossible, you can't expect us to have an overview of our supply chain. While these companies at the same time are selling themselves as front runners of innovation. Um, so I think here, uh, the, the, yeah, the challenge that we still need to overcome is, is really believing together that it is important to address um, human rights throughout the, the entire supply chain coming to our countries um, or, or not really, but any other uh, impacts that we might have and make sure that those are positive. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much uh, to you as well. I think uh, that all your responses and the presentation are really well, well fitting one with the other. You, you have managed to give really uh, different angles and different perspective uh, on, uh, on topics that they look on, on the surface different, but in reality, they are, they are, they are very close to each other. They, they are complementary, I would say one with each other, uh, because all the things you have said. So, and that's, and that's how it should be with, the, with human rights and how it should be with the sustainable development world, the complementarity. And complementarity, but not simply that the, the, the total is equal to the sum of the different pieces. No, the total, it's incremental, gets more. And, and this is how I'm feeling right now after after listening to each one of your of your presentation, that the the contribution of each one of you is the total is much more than than each one of you separate. So I really appreciate appreciate your time. Uh, I didn't see any additional questions from the public, and I would have a question so we could go on until tomorrow. Uh, uh, <laughs> Chinese time, <laughs> Chinese time, not the European or Eastern time, but the time has ended for our, for our event of today. It's already 1.37, so for respect of the time, respect of our attendees, I simply would like to thank uh, each one of you for, uh, for your contribution. I hope this is the beginning of our conversation, it's not uh, for some of you, it's actually the continuation already for a long time. So I hope this conversation will continue uh, in a different uh, context and in different out, out, outsets. And uh, I really thank each one of you for your presentation. I thank the Everly College, Dean Dana Way, Associate Dean Duncan Lorimer, Bradley Wilson, and thanks again for your question, Bradley, and for the support of your Center of Resilient Communities at WVU. And uh, on, on this point, if there are no further comments from each one of you, I, I think I would, uh, I would take my lead of closing the event and, uh, and thanking uh, again uh, every, each one of you and the attendees for being there uh, at this time. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank we can. You. Thank you. Thank you. And we conclude the recording.